So, uh, what kind of computer ran the first web server? Anyone? Oh, I heard a next cube from over here. That is the correct answer. Give the man a round of applause while he gets his mouse pad and t-shirt. So question number two for a book on PCI compliance from uh, Singress. Uh, what Outlook macrovirus was the first to infect a million computers? <laughs> I'm sorry, it says Melissa, but the person that said Outlook. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I'm giving it to the guy that said Outlook. <laughs> I think that was. He's not coming forward, so Melissa can have it. <laughs> so, are the AV folks ready that's in the back? Are there AV folks in the back? Hey, there aren't any AV folks in the back. We'll deal with that. So um, now I present to you uh, Michael Weigand. He is going to give you, uh, well, a talk on building your own Predator UAV. Give him a round of applause. Good afternoon, ShmooCon. Is my mic working? Everybody hear me? Awesome. All right, so today, again, building your own Predator UAV at 99.95% discount. Um, before I really get started with the presentation, I just want to give you a little demo. Uh, just yesterday, we took the uh, plane out in front of the hotel. Bellhop gave us a really strange look. And uh, we put it up about two hours after the snow started falling. So uh, let's see if we can show you the video we hashed together. Woodward Park Marriott inside. Goliath copies all. Go ahead. Target head to the left. To the left. Alpha, this is your one. Target on site. So you can see the, uh, the hotel right there. We're kind of going around to the back. Let's get a look down. I personally wanted to get a shot of Bruce uh, in his snowshoes, you know, trekking around outside, but I don't know if we caught him or not. Weather front interference. All right, snow's starting to look heavy now. Let's roll out. <laughs> off target, off target. So the RF link admittedly was absolutely terrible. I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't really tell what was going on. I blame that entirely on the snow and all the embassies with their jammers in the area because I have never seen anything so bad in my life before. That's a really quick... Um, just the, I got to give the standard disclaimer. I am a kid out at the United States Military Academy, which means I'm 21. I don't really know a lot. I'm just a student. So uh, I have to give this, uh, this disclaimer that every, anything I say or do up here uh, doesn't represent the, the Army, DOD, West Point. All this information used at your own risk. Just like anything, it can be used for, uh, for profit or gain or for some pretty terrible things if you put your mind to it. So uh, don't, don't come looking at me afterwards. Okay, everybody's seen the MQ-9 Reaper or the Predator drone. This is a picture I found on the internet of it uh, in some sandy environment. Unfortunately, I, the title of the talk is a little misleading. This is the actual plane up here today that I'm going to show you how to make. And uh, it's not quite a Predator, I'm sorry. It doesn't have the cool missiles on the bottom and it, it doesn't fly for 20 hours, but... Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's right. I haven't installed them for this demo because that would look a little sketch, but uh, you can do what you like. So uh, real quick introduction to UAVs and autonomous technology. Autonomous basically essentially means a, a self-governing. It's a robot that makes its own decisions. It's independent of human interaction. Um, the best thing about autonomous systems is that when applied to aerial vehicles, we actually have taken the technology uh, pretty far so far. With ground robots, you have to take in a consideration of the environment and sensing, obstacle avoidance, and all this other jazz. And when we put a plane up in the sky, we know we got to deal with, uh, you know, with the fluid that it's coming through the air. The weather, obviously, can be a problem like we found out yesterday. But it's actually a lot easier to uh, make autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles when we're dealing with airspace instead of ground space, um, or in some cases, sea space. So a lot of the autonomous technologies that we see out there all the advanced stuff has been created predominantly for aerial systems. 
Now, some of this has matriculated down to the hobbyist level where my budget kind of comes into play. Um, and so I'm going to you know, kind of demonstrate where the current status of this technology is, how you can go out, assemble the parts, and uh, you know, put a pretty cool system together and apply it for your own, uh, your own needs. So the marketplace, just a quick overview of uh, where UAV systems fall, uh, especially when you want to go out and buy your own autopilot and put it in a, a model. Um, in the red uh, box you see up there, these are commercial vendors, Micropilot, Proctorus, UNAV, CloudCap. They sell basically ready-made autopilot systems that you can integrate in anything from a Cessna to a little tiny you know, a hobby foam plane like I have in front of me here. These systems can range in cost anywhere from $1,000 to $30,000. And if you pay these guys enough money, they'll basically make anything happen. Unfortunately, like I mentioned, I'm just here on a, a student salary. So I'm more interested in the, the free, open source, extremely inexpensive systems, which is probably what you guys came to hear about as well. Starting at the very bottom, the Ardu Pilot is the system that I based my drone on here and that I'm going to talk about for the remainder of the, uh, of the talk. But there's also some great uh, pro, uh, other projects out there. The UDEV board, Paparazzi, these systems have been around for a long time, especially Paparazzi. It's based on, uh, I'm not even going to actually attempt to speak on it because I'm not too familiar with it. But <laughs> it's been out there for a number of years and it's been uh, developed for several different airframes and utilized successfully. Uh, if you guys want to check out some of the other systems, I'd highly suggest you uh, reference this slide. Just Google these keywords and there's a wealth of information out there. So UAV essentials. Obviously, the first thing we want our UAV to do is to simply fly, to get up in the, into the air and, uh, and stay up there. This requires the, the plane itself to inherently have some stabilization and to be able to take care of itself when a gust of wind kind of tips it on its side or whatnot. And also to maintain you know, thrust and lift uh, greater than uh, you know, drag and weight. I threw the little physics block diagram up there in case there were any scientists in the crowd to kind of you know, give a free body diagram of how a plane moves through the air. But essentially, what we care about is main, making sure that the plane stays up in the sky. Once we have that problem solved, then we can deal with navigation. Where's the plane going to go? And this really isn't that complex a problem, especially when we have GPS sensors, um, IMUs, and other devices that can give us a relatively precise location on the planet. And then, obviously, our third task is dealing with our operating payload. The whole reason we put the UAV up in the sky is so that it could carry something to do something useful, usually sensing, sniffing, transmitting. On the plane I have in front of me, and I'll show a blow-up picture for those of you who can't see, I simply just have a camera on. That's what we flew with yesterday. Obviously, that camera feed looked pretty bad, but that was the, uh, the RF link. But it would be all too easy for somebody to create a... Uh, a wireless sniffer, war flying has been done before, and those payloads can very easily be carried by this airframe here, or one that you could engineer. Uh, transmitting uh, signals would be very easy to do. Um, you can even mount lasers on pan tilt gyros on the bottom of these sensors, you know, in a, in a very small package, and basically do whatever you like. So that's pretty cool. All right, stabilization. So <laughs> wings level, please. There's two basic systems that are going to allow us to keep our plane up in the air, flying wings level, and, and relatively carefree. The cheapest, easiest solution is based on infrared sensors called thermopiles. As you can see there, they're really small. I don't know if any of you guys can see, but at the very top of the plane here, I have this black box. That black box right there just has four sensors on it that just uh, read the infrared differential between the sky and the ground. I'll talk about that next slide. The uh, second system that really aids us is an inertial measurement unit. Now, these are a little bit more expensive, you know, in the $100 to $200 range. And uh, they're, they're not that accurate right now. They're susceptible to drift over time. Essentially, they're just a mix of gyroscopes and um, MEMS accelerometers that are going to allow us to detect the uh, different forces upon the plane. That, coupled with GPS and thrown in uh, some control algorithms, actually gives us a very accurate um, idea of what's happening to the plane. And then we can adjust uh, making servo corrections. So depending on how complex you want your system to go, you'll either go with the infrared sensors or with the inertial measurement unit. So the thermopile-based the thermopile approach. In the upper right, you see the uh, FMA Direct Copilot. This is the main sensor. This is the one I'm using here. 
I think it goes for about $50, $40. It's very inexpensive. All it does, as you can see the picture on the left with the fighter jet, is uh, it has these windows, these little thermopile devices on two axes, and it detects the, thermal, the uh, thermal differential between the sky and the ground. When we go outside, even on a day like today, uh, you know, where the ground's covered in snow and ice, the ground is still going to have a warmer heat signature than the sky or than space. And so because we get a nice little uh, bell curve, like you can see in the lower right-hand corner, we can take these values in and then just using a microcontroller and a very simple algorithm, we can then send out signals to our servos, which will move our control surfaces and level the plane out. Um, this device right here will level us out in two axes. Going like this and like this. So I can't remember the names. I think it's like pitch and something, but you know, whatever. We'll deal with that later. So servos. Um, servos are kind of a, an important thing to, uh, to know with a plane because these are the mechanisms that move the control surfaces. Many of you um, may be familiar with these. I don't think I was supposed to say that. But uh, essentially, it's just a motor uh, control circuit and a potentiometer. And they're controlled by sending out a pulse width modulated signal every two milliseconds. And you can just rotate the arm, usually about 180 degrees from left to right or 90 degrees. Some models are continuous rotating, like on the parallax robots, where they actually use the servos just to turn wheels and, and drive robots around. Uh, we use these to. Um, make very precise movements to the control surfaces, like the ailerons, the elevators, the rudders on a plane. And this is what's essentially going to allow us control over our airframe. So now, the brains of the operation. The Ardu pilot. This is the $25 autopilot that made uh, a bit of a splash on the scene about a year and a half, two years ago. It's based around the popular Ardu pilot microcontroller and was created by a guy named Jordi Munoz. Um, Jordi Munoz met the Wired editor-in-chief Chris Anderson, and together they kind of built a community called DIYDrones.com. Now this community is the place to go if you're interested in UAVs. It's, you know, uh, let, me, let me caveat that. If you're interested in making your own UAV. These guys are the ones who like to know everything from, from nuts to, or soup to nuts, and uh, they build their own systems from the ground up. Um, their focus is on inexpensive, uh, systems and everything that they publish is open source and open hardware, so they're a great reference. I highly recommend you guys check that website out if you're interested. So the Ardu pilot, uh, about a year ago, they released a shield, which if you guys are familiar with Arduinos, shields are just uh, circuit boards that just snap on top of, um, of the base board. The Ardu pilot shield brings a couple more uh, systems to, to play in an easy, integrated, and very small fashion. Here you can see that black box with the two uh, nozzles coming out. That is a differential pressure sensor. And when we connect a rubber hose to a, a tube out front, we can measure airspeed. This also has uh, some circuitry that allows us to update the code on the uh, microcontroller without having to unplug the GPS since they both share a single serial line, which is a disadvantage. I'll talk about how uh, the community is overcoming now. But anyways, when you mount the shield on top of the Ardu pilot board, you essentially have all the basic components that you need for a fully integrated autopilot system. Now, Ardu pilot's gone through a couple different uh, generations. They're currently on generation 2.5, a version 2.5 of their code. And uh, the system overview has changed slightly. Initially, they were using the FMA co-pilot system to provide stabilization totally separate from the Ardu pilot. But now, with the shield, you can actually connect the uh, thermopile systems directly in to the shield board, which communicates with the Ardu pilot. And the Ardu pilot makes all the calculations for us. So we, we take that third-party application out of, the, uh, out of the picture. As you can see here, though, I just want to point out, we have a RC uh, receiver on here. Um, this isn't a completely autonomous system. I guess the best way to put it is semi-autonomous. Takeoff and landing still has to be done manually at the moment. This is a problem that the community is working on. But it's also important for uh, FAA legal issues that we be able to take control of the plane, you know, safety's sake. Let's say yesterday I was flying the plane and, you know, it starts to head on over to the vice president's house. I'm probably going to want to flip a switch and bring it back before I get arrested. So um, that's a, a key component I just want to point out. But anyways, it's received signals just dump right into the Ardu pilot, which then connects straight to the servos to the electronic speed controller in the bottom right, which is essentially our throttle. This gives us uh, filtered power for all our, our devices. 
connects the battery and also allows uh, or also connects to the uh, to the motor.